So we'll uh, quickly run through what we covered yesterday and then continue with today's session. Yesterday we checked we can represent data in rows and columns. If we conceive data in rows and columns, the general operations that are possible are select, filter, select certain rows, certain columns, or filter based on a condition, and relate if there are more than one tables. We can do the relationships between them and do joins. Beyond that, what can we do mathematically is uh, most of the SQL packages or all the SQL packages like SQL Server or Oracle for that matter, even the NoSQL uh, uh, databases give us aggregate functions. Those are inbuilt functions and we can write our own functions also to call it. What are those aggregate functions? All statistical functions, right? Uh, we can call max, min, average, everything. And in this use case, if you have uh, somebody saying something. OK, in this use case, uh, we discussed uh, in this context, we discussed distance, distance between two rows. The distance typically calculated are the Euclidean distance. That is the distance by default calculated. And we get this something called distance matrix. And based on the distance matrix is what segmentation or clustering is done. <coughs> But what the math we discussed yesterday is what are the different um, what are the different distance formulas one can think of. Uh, so we discussed various distance formulas. Uh, Euclidean distance was one and uh, we also discussed uh, the uh, Euclidean distance that is different from uh, Manhattan distance. What is a Manhattan distance? Manhattan distance is the distance that is uh, calculated by our GIS maps, GPS maps, right? Uh, Google maps, etc, etc. So for Manhattan distance, there is no formula per se. Why there is no formula per se? There can be more than one Manhattan distance. Uh, in this case, between point A and B, there can be only one Euclidean distance, whereas the green is also Manhattan distance. Uh, the blue is also Manhattan distance. So the distance functions will have to be uh, um, return on our own. In then we we also discussed about cosine distance. Cosine distance uh, uh, we saw it is going to give us a direction also. Uh, so we have two data points that is A and B. Uh, between these two data points, uh, we want to find distance. And I'll move to the next slide quickly. If the data point between A and B, the distance is calculated using Euclidean distance, we calculate what, what is there in this colored area. Uh, cosine distance, on the other hand, will use the uh, theta as the proxy. The larger the theta, the larger the distance. So what is that we miss out on this? We miss out on the magnitude of the distance. So we uh, uh, take the two vectors and find theta and uh, from theta we do cos inverse, we get distance between minus one and plus one. That is the cosine distance. Uh, we get the direction as well. And uh, what else we discussed yesterday? We discussed summary statistics. Uh, we discussed all the summary statistics. Uh, we can calculate average of a data. And uh, let's say if the average is uh, some x value, uh, we can find another data set with same average. We can find n number of data sets with same average. Uh, so a data, two data sets can have same average. Two or more data sets can have same average, same median, same mode, same standard deviation, same metrics. So uh, how how we will differentiate one data set from the other if the statistics is not differentiating? That is the biggest question, right? So uh, the example here we discussed this. This four data sets, all four data sets are very different data sets, but still all four data sets have same mean, same standard deviation, same correlation coefficient, same mode, uh, everything same. So this is the ANSCOMS quartet, if people remember that uh, jargon. Um, now, how do I differentiate it? That's where distributions come handy. What are the distributions? Distributions are uh, nothing but our uh, 
uh, in the x-axis we do uh, bin the data. Let's say the data is between 0 and 100. We bin uh, 10, we make 10 bins or 20 bins and we plot the count in each bin as a bar chart and what we eventually get is histogram. In this histogram, they that typically will be only one peak like this. It may or may not be a normal distribution. It may may not be symmetric, but typically in a di given distribution, any given distribution, there has to be only one peak. And if there are more than one peak, we are in trouble. What is the trouble we are in? If there are more than one peak, whenever we say we model a parameter or we we, uh, we build a predictive model for uh, any parameter. What we model is the average behavior. Whenever there are more than one peak, like it is given here, if you notice the average behavior is somewhat in the middle, but the peaks are on either sides. So our accuracy will take a hit. So what we say is uh, for, uh, uh, for a uh, for any data set with more than one peak, we have to investigate the data and uh, try to split the data. We'll talk about it. Uh, so the expectation is uh, the data has only one peak. If the data has more than one peak or not all the um, methodologies or techniques address more than one peak. Deep learning addresses this more than one peak uh, because deep learning inherently builds multiple models. So they build multiple models, uh, so they take care of all the peaks, but otherwise uh, many algorithms don't address multiple peaks. And the examples we saw yesterday was uh, the iris distributions. Uh, iris has four variables. Iris data set has four variables. Sepal length and width, petal length and width, uh, 150 records, basically 150 samples where data is collected. And when we plotted, we saw the pe petal. There are two groups of petals. One is small petals, another is large petals. Uh, so actually speaking, iris data set has three species. But if we don't have that in information from the histogram, we can conclude it has two data sets. Two or more data sets. Let's say, uh, let's put it like that. So whenever you see there are more than one peak in a histogram, it should trigger you. What is that we should be working on? Uh, so we check this in the uh, uh, Excel charts also. And uh, for distributions, we had standard distributions also, right? So uh, for many reasons, for many use cases, the distributions are already available. Uh, we don't have to conduct the experiment. That's where the standard distributions came into picture and uh, the standard distributions are as presented here. Normal distribution, binomial distribution, Poisson, exponential, negative binomial, beta, and there are a few more distributions like gamma distribution, Weibull distribution. You can take a look at it. So what distributions are standardized? Uh, we'll start from binomial. Whenever there is a parameter which is which we can say success or failure, and we want to model number of times we get a success, then we model it using binomial distribution. So of the 20 times I toss the coin or of the 20 visitors who come to my website, 30% of them download the newsletter. That's the use case here. 30% of them download the newsletter. So every day I get 20 visitors, I get 30% uh, downloading the newsletter. Uh, what will be the distribution? What will be the probability that 50% downloads the newsletter? So to model that, we don't have to sit and collect data over a long period of time. Binomial distribution uh, helps us model the situation like that. Similarly, if you want to uh, uh, find the rare events, for example, number of virus attacks in a month for all the websites we have. So there can be two, two attacks or three attacks. Uh, what is the probability that I get two attacks? What is the probability that I get three attacks? Uh, what is the probability that we have 10 attacks? The problem uh, finding probability in such a scenario is we do not have a denominator. When we say denominator of the 10 attempts, two of them succeeded, then 20% success rate in virus attacks. But I don't know the number of attempts, right? So denominator is missing altogether. 
i have only one number that is the number of attacks that has happened in such cases we model using poisson distribution uh, we don't have to conduct an experiment we can't conduct an experiment because we don't know the denominator so we use a poisson distribution to model the uh, parameter and get the uh, you know and get the uh, probabilities so and exponential distribution is up is applicable wherever we want to model the waiting time so let's say time spent on a website before filling the application form or time spent in a bus stop before boarding the bus before uh, bus arrives to the bus stop so anything that is uh, waiting time is involved that waiting time can be modeled with the help of an exponential distribution similarly there is beta distribution which will model the probabilities negative binomial distribution is a uh, uh is similar to exponential distribution but uh, in, instead of waiting till a point we here we, we wait till three or four successes n number of successes so uh, the example given here is visitors signing up for services after checking the pricing page three times this can be modeled as a negative binomial distribution so to model uh, distributions we we give this as a input parameters and if you notice most of the distributions don't have values on the negative side all of them have values zero or above uh, whereas uh, uh, where it is permitted is a normal distribution that's where negative values are permitted so if you have negative values uh, just be cautious that you use normal distribution for modeling now that we have so many distributions where is this used the wherever whichever distribute whichever uh, uh, whatever we are modeling we have to check the distribution so we'll check the model today and before we go to the model the other thing we discussed yesterday was uh, the standardization so uh, we have a data when we say we have a data of let's say 10 columns of data every column of data is transformed when we do standardization why do we do standardization each column of data can be at different scales some columns may have values in thousands some columns may have values in hundreds some columns may have values in decimals some columns may have values in negative uh, dimension so it's all possible right so to bring all of them in the same scale we do standardization when we do standardization what do we mean we transform the data in that particular column with reference to a different value or a desired value uh, the the standardization which we typically talk about or standard standardization method is uh, minus mean divided by standard deviation uh, what does this mean we represent the data in terms of standard deviation of that column how many standard deviations away from the the value is how many standard deviations away from the central value so mean and standard deviation will determine the new column so our uh, reference points are mean and standard deviation similarly we can have min and max or the range uh, based on the min so if we use min as the reference point uh, min value will be zero the rest of the values will be based on uh where do they stand with a vis a vis or with respect to the minimum value so that is another way to standardize it uh we also discussed about max uh when we divide by max uh the maximum value will have one and the rest of the value will be with respect to that particular maximum value how much smaller the value when compared to that maximum value we also discussed about divided by mean what do we mean by divided by mean uh in a time series use case as we discussed yesterday if we divide the values by average we come to know where the time series is above average and where the time series is below average for example in a sales data set in indian scenario the festivals all are in the third fourth quarter that is if you notice all the all the dashara diwali christmas new year uh Uh, you know all that falls in the last quarter of the year so last quarter of the year will will have an above average sale and the first three quarters will have below average sale that is the standard expectation so uh, when we do x divided by mean of x we get values 1 plus or 1 minus 
the range will be in that range. Uh, that that way you can standardize. If you have ten time series, all the ten time series can be standardized by dividing by the mean. Uh, that's where this x divided by mean of x came in. And we also discussed if you have two columns, uh, one one column divided by the other, and tan inverse of that will give us a new set of standard deviation. That will give us between zero and one. And the mathematical implications uh, can be borne in mind and then uh, interpreted. So tan inverse also can be uh, interpreted as a normalization uh, technique or standardization technique. So this is where we stopped. I think uh, another thing which we discussed is the matrix representation. The matrix representation, uh, the data in uh, rows and columns. We had the data set yesterday. Where the data is presented in rows and columns, each row is a record. Uh, there, if there are hundred rows, the uh, each row can be represented as matrix as well. We can create hundred matrix and use that data or use the matrices to build a model. Uh, why would that be a better representation? If you are using uh, convolution neural network architectures, and if you if you are uh, in keen on Building a convolution neural network architectures on your own, then a matrix representation uh, would yield better results. In general, that's how I I don't uh, in general I'm uh, mentioning this, but there may be exceptions. Uh, you can get into it when you work on it, but in general, I see a matrix representation and CNN architectures uh, yield better results. So that's where we stopped yesterday. So any questions on this? We can quickly jump into it before uh, moving on to today's sessions. Any questions? So if there are no questions, let's move into it. Uh, move into today's session. So today we are supposed to discuss regression in general. How do we do regression? What is R square? And what is non-linearity? How do we address it? And classification. Classification also has linear, non-linear. We will discuss linear, non-linear, uh, and then uh, we have be done. And we will cover dimensionality reduction and increase tomorrow. Uh, today we will not discuss this. Uh, so today's session is expected to be a little shorter. Please bear with us. And clustering we discussed yesterday, right? The idea behind clustering is the core behind clustering is the distance formula. So we covered it in yesterday's session, so we will not cover that again. Uh, so clustering is something we will not cover. Dimensionality reduction or increase will cover tomorrow. Uh, that will do it. Today we'll cover the regression and uh, classification. So what is a regression? A regression uh, when this is in two dimensions, uh, you have a value y. The va value y is the uh, modeled one. Look at it. Y is equal to a plus bx plus epsilon. If it is a plus bx, there is no error component. This is the error component. Then it is a mathematical straight line, right? Y equal to mx is y equal to mx plus c is a straight line formula, but uh, it's not y equal to mx plus c always. There is some deviation left or right. There will be some deviation. This deviation is what causes statistical, uh, you know. Uh, challenges and we address them. So y is equal to a plus bx. Y is the variable which we are looking to model. And x is the variable which is given as an input. And uh, uh, if you remember the distributions, we should check the distribution of y so that we see if uh, uh, any uh, transformations has to be applied. If y is not normal, if y is not normally distributed, then transformations needs to be applied. We will discuss what do we mean by y is not normally distributed. Uh, now that we know we have two column of data, x and y, the math, this is the math uh, uh, behind this regression equation. Uh, how do you find a and b? That is the key, right? So we create two simultaneous equations. This is as a result of least squares math. Let's not get into the least squares math. All that we have to understand is everything is constant except A and B. A and B are variables and everything else is constant. 
eventually we get a simultaneous equations with two unknowns two equations with two unknowns we solve the simultaneous equation and identify the two unknowns that is a and b we will find it what is a a is a constant uh, and b is the slope so far people should be comfortable with b some places it is m they call it here they call it bmx plus c or a plus bx so uh, we find this so now how do we know y is normally distributed uh, here for each input x has uh, input from 1 to 7 for each input y got to be normally distributed so what do we mean by y is normally distributed i'll give you an example if you notice here this is the value x this is the value y for each value the the variation uh, is from the mean that's what normally distributed right if you take the average value and calculate the standard deviation it has to be same this is what normal distribution is all about so if this is normally distributed what is that we are modeling we are modeling the averages for one what is the average for two what is the average for three what is the average for four what is the average and if you connect all the averages it will form a straight line that's the key here right so uh, if then it's, it forms a straight line uh, we call this a linear regression if the values of y are normally distributed what if the values of y are not normally distributed i have prepared an excel template you can play with the values here uh, but uh, yeah i give the regression template here you can play with the values here so if you notice here the blue is uh, normal uh, which one is normally distributed uh, okay one second yes the orange is normally distributed whereas uh, the blue is not normally distributed how do we know that let's play you hit f9 uh, if you notice the values for six is having higher variance compared to values for one and blue whereas in orange the values for six has same variance as any other stuff here as the as the number increases the variance increases notice the variance of, of variance for x is equal to one is small and it increased the variance increases when x is equal to two variance increases further when x is equal to three variance increases further when x is equal to four and so on right so the variance is not constant when the variance is not constant uh, it cannot be a normal distribution variance has to be constant and it has to be symmetric then it's a normal distribution like we see here like we see here uh, the variance is constant and uh, symmetric distribution is symmetric we call it normal distribution right so henceforth that becomes a standard deviation that becomes a linear regression in this scenario if you notice as the value increases the variance also increases so this is the property of a poisson distribution uh, so that's a that's a classical probability of a poisson distribution if you want to discuss other probabilities there are a couple of interesting probabilities uh, so we know what are the probabilities of a normal distribution right it is a bell curve symmetric uh, variance is uh, constant not constant here it's symmetric on either side it has one peak whereas binomial distribution is also symmetric uh, and uh, variance is not normal variance is slightly higher than the normal whereas for poisson distribution variance will be uh, equal to the mean so if the mean is higher the variance will be higher if the mean is smaller variance will be smaller whereas for uh, negative binomial distribution there will be a fatter tail whereas for exponential distribution there will be a thinner tail so these are some of the probabilities so some of the properties of the distribution you can when you go deep into each distribution you will get to learn this and there is mathematical reasoning behind all these properties that also you can learn here we are just touching upon things so we don't get deeper into it now that uh, we know how to find uh, values for a and b uh, we can predict the linear regression uh, what what happens if you have uh, built a linear regression for a scenario like this where the variance is not constant basically y is not normally distributed 
we have gone ahead and built a normal distribution, built a linear regression. What will happen in this particular case? What will happen is if if the things are there, uh, we would hit negative values. We may hit negative values. That is one. And uh, uh, otherwise, in some cases, the values will be accurate. Some cases, values will not be accurate. So the accuracy becomes a question, or we end up getting negative values sometimes. So uh, given the knowledge of the distribution of Y, we can apply right transformations and uh, up, get the nonlinearity modeled. So let's talk about that. Before talking about the nonlinearity, we'll talk about how do we measure the accuracies. Accuracies are measured using uh, mean squared error. Uh, what is a mean squared error? Uh, let's say we have modeled uh, the variable y with straight line and the straight line is like this and actual value is here. Our predicted value will always be here. What happens here? If you can tell me if you give x as an input, there can be only one output. There cannot be multiple output. But uh, when you observe values, you observe multiple values for the same x. Whereas predicted value would be there is only one. So uh, there will be a variation between the observed value and the predicted value. This variation is counted as error. Since the variation can be positive, negative, we do the squaring and we do the squaring for each of the values and uh, we take an average of all the squared errors. We end up with mean squared error. Now that we got the mean squared error, uh, <coughs> what this mean squared error imply? Mean squared error tells this much is the error. Uh, how, how do we interpret this number? Does that number even mean anything to us? Let's say I am giving for a given model mean square error is 23.8 or 238.4. I give a mean squared error. Does that even mean anything to us? How do you interpret the number? The mean squared error. Somebody has any anybody has thoughts on this? People would have. Calculated mean squared error. Anybody has any thoughts on this mean squared error? Does it mean anything at all to any of you? To me, it doesn't mean anything. It's a number, right? What is a number? Uh, average is 38. That is also a number. Standard deviation is 2.5. That is also a number. But how do I make sense of this number? <coughs> what does that number even mean to me? So these <coughs> all the statistics which we described in this slide, all the statistics which we described are just a number. This number will start making sense when <coughs> we interpret <coughs> with the other number, another model's number. Let's say I have a different model. Uh, for the same data, I build four models. All the four for all the four models, I calculate mean squared error. Now it will start making sense, right? Uh, the mean, the model with the least mean squared error is the best model. That is a conclusion I can draw. Otherwise, there is no way I can use this mean squared error as a number. Uh, the same applies for all the statistic. But here mean squared error there is something called R square. Uh, people remember what an R square is. R square gives you value between 0 and 1. It should be higher, higher the better. All that are standard. Uh, uh, people have uh, uh, have that as a standard thumb rule. But why the R square should be higher? What does that higher R square mean? So, so what does that R square mean is uh, it compares with the basic model. Let's say this is the model we have, the blue color model. And uh, if we have not used this model and taken simple average of phi, a y bar, that also will have the errors. So it calculates the errors for a basic model and it calculates the errors for the linear model. And one over the other gives you the R square. So here uh, 
sum of squares of a built model divided by sum of squares of the average model uh, what will this give the higher the number uh, the smaller the uh, so total error is this is residual error so basically one divided by the error the mo uh, model so the error of model 2 divided by the error of model 1 so we have two models eventually error of model 2 divided by error of model 1 error of model 2 is expected to be smaller compared to the error of model 1 this is the total error this is the regression residual error so if the numerator is expected to be smaller and uh, the smaller it is and 1 minus will become so the numerator is the the total value is expected to be less than 1 if the numerator is smaller compared to denominator the tot, the one divided by the other will give me the value less than 1 and when you subtract uh, that value from 1 we get what we have r square then if the 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 error from the blue color model smaller the better and we get a higher r square so basically r square is a relativistic measure when we have two models we want to see how the latest model performed compared to the previous model then r square means this so if the uh, previous model is the naive model no regression applied simple average is applied then r square should be higher let's say i have a second model which is a regression third model which is again a regression model only the slope is different then i wouldn't get the the sum of squares will be more or less same i will get a smaller r square now now let's talk about an extreme scenario what if the numerator is larger than the denominator what if the error in the regression model is larger than the previous model we end up getting r square negative is everybody seeing that so uh, standard uh, uh, standard is we always compare the regression model with the average model whereas we can compare any two models and calculate r square only thing is we have to put the smaller uh, sum of squares divided by the larger sum of squares so that r square is always positive so is this r square explanation clear here they have given yes sir and yes sir it's nothing but a mean square error for the uh, naive model and regression models there is another interpretation of r square uh, that is the percentage of the variation explained by the model that's one way to interpret it but mathematically this is what it means you compare two models and see which one is better and how much better it is uh, ramnathan one question i have sure uh, i understand when you said uh, two models can be compared Uh, with this r square uh, comparison but uh, when you say average model what do you mean when i say average model you remember the math which we discussed we find a and b and do the prediction mm -hmm. why we predict we have a predicted y predicted y is nothing but this line the actual okay. y is nothing but this circles okay agreed so yes. we say y depends on x if x value is higher y value is higher If x value is smaller, y value is smaller. That's what this regression line says. Mm -hmm. So instead okay. of depending on x, we simply take a average of all the y values. We ignore x, and that also is a model, right? That also is a straight line. Let's say y is equal to three point five. There is no x component. Uh, let's go here. Y is equal to only three point five. There is no x component. A plus epsilon. There is no dependency on this, so we take a simple average of y and call that a model. That will be a worse bad model compared to a regression okay. model, right? With the x dependency. Okay. So this is what the two models are generally compared, but we can compare any two models. Okay. 
and this r square uh, will be positive the question asked generally is can r square be negative and if you know the math you can answer that if you don't know the math r square uh, we we cannot get our head around because r is square it cannot be a negative value no it can be a negative value in certain situations so that's where the uh, deep dive into the math helps okay uh, sorry another question i have sure uh, in the next slide the slide number 13 mm -hmm. so here uh, i did not understand one point here mm -hmm. the assumption made for the x is they are discrete values right uh, x is discrete values or even for that matter continuous values yeah let's assume it's discrete what is your question no, my question was more about uh, in reality it could be analogous it could be continuous it could be continuous so in that case how do we understand the y is normally distributed okay you bucket it you bin it so you take the x value continuous value you bin the value let's say the values range between 0 and 10 make it into 10 bins and for each bin you should see normal distribution okay so in each bin uh, the y is considered uh, for example like a at a discrete value so finally yes. that's the idea yeah you you make uh, so uh, yeah that's what you do it x is discrete in the, in the examples which we see but it can be continuous even in that case uh, there are tests available to see if the data is normally distributed or not or what do we mean by normally distributed uh, there has to be a mean the standard deviation on either sides should be symmetric and uh, standard deviation has to be constant across so symmetricity is possible right for every bin we can check the symmetricity from the mean on either side the, the values number of values and the extent of the values should be more or less same. It won't be exactly same. Should be more or less same. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Uh, now, uh, now that we discussed what is R square, basically it's comparing mm, two relatives, two models, and then uh, taking a stand on it. There is another interpretation. R square gives you the variation explained by the model uh, that's uh, that's also a mathematical inference but uh, today we discussed this i would uh, request if you have time and interest please go go through that interpretation and see if that also makes sense okay now uh, let's come to this we discussed uh, okay we know that uh, the values cannot be negative uh, and the data is distributed uh, in a Poisson distribution for that matter. Okay, if the data is a Poisson distribution, then we know, right, as uh, um, average increases, in this case, average increases, the variance also increases. If the average is small, the variance also will be small. And uh, if we notice this, why is this harder? Well, first thing, it is harder to do it um, because uh, uh, your x is not one single variable. X is typically there are 10 variables in a model. So there are challenges here, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at how to address those challenges a little later. Let's assume there are only two variables and uh, we see this phenomenon. Okay, y is distributed for each x. Uh, otherwise, if there are 10 variables, we have to see for each uh, groups. Uh, we'll discuss that if you have time. Otherwise, uh, we can take a look at it later. Uh, now, this is not normally distributed. Henceforth, this is uh, becoming non-linear, right? So, uh, if we have an idea, the distribution, then we apply certain transformations. Even otherwise, blindly certain transformations can be applied. So, this is a curve which goes increasing exponentially. So this could be e to the power of 1, this could be e to the power of 1.5, e to the power of 2, 2.5, approximately, not exactly though. So if we get this final result, uh, that is, um, uh, if, we, if we get a straight line and transform it to exponential, and then we may end up with nonlinear curve. Let's say we take this straight line, we take this straight line, and for each line, I apply exponential transformation. What happens? The higher the value, the exponential transformation will be much higher. 
the smaller the value exponential transformation will be much smaller right so uh, if it is poisson distribution uh, we do this exponential transformation we get uh, non linearity but uh, the right side is difficult so what do we do we take the y variable because right side this is what we have to build right so we take the y variable and make it into a log so uh, log of uh, y variable is equal to b not plus b1 xi there may be 10x variables that's why they are given xi b not plus b1 xi plus x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 etc etc and uh, that is log and eventually how do we interpret it we first build the model that is a linear model we get the results and we do e to the power of that result that's what the prediction is for each x we build the model we get the straight line and once we get the straight line we apply the exponential transformation so that we get the non linearity here so we had to do so many things right but we never did all this we always uh, worked on a linear regression and non linearity we never bothered and uh, many cases that was still okay we would have got a decent r square whatever it is uh, but uh, this would be much more appropriate representation uh, of the model right so now that we have this our uh, 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 we have to calculate the mean squared error of the transformed uh, model we get this now how do we do this so every function every package gives something called a link function the link function can be either log or a poisson distribution so let's take this uh, this one i think is what this is called generalized linear models this is where we did this uh, if the, here they are given the code for python yes so get the poisson families and apply the log transformation so you have a family of exponential distribution you have family of normal normal you don't have to mention any anything special but whereas for all other distributions we have to do binomial uh binomial poisson exponential uh, the other example i have here is how do i do exponential regression let's see what that gives the transformation is made see here y is equal to ae to the power of beta x this is nothing but an exponential distribution so to make it linear they make log both the sides if you notice for poisson there is a log e e exponential on one side which gets transformed into log on only one side of the equation your log comes on both the sides of the equation once we make this log transformation it becomes linear how the code is written uh, for python okay so this is all done in excel uh, so how they have done in excel is they have applied it and then applied the transformation exponential twice and then got it otherwise if you can say link functions for non generalized linear models this is called link function every every time you only do linear regression there is nothing called non linear regression after doing the linear regression you apply the link function so that uh, it becomes it addresses the non linearity uh, i think this will have a better uh, uh, link functions for all of them here it is for normal there is no link function it's identity only exponential and gamma it's called negative link function for poisson it's called log link function for binomial bernoulli and categorical multinomial it's called logit link function all this we'll discuss the logic uh, logistic link regression so there we'll discuss this logit link function okay so far so good uh, we'll discuss the logistic regression logistic regression is a special case of regression actually it's we are solving a classification problem here uh, using regression technique using linear regression technique that's the importance so the variable y we have x and y here right we have x and y here the variable y has only 0 and 1 that is whether the person will default or not 
so logistic regression i don't have an example i didn't create an example here yeah i didn't create an example here uh, i can also give an example now in the website context uh, how many people uh, so i i get 100 visitors uh, whether they sign up or not for the application whether do they do they apply uh, or not so uh, the y variable will have if they apply using the form in the website it is one otherwise zero so for 100 records i'll have ones and zeros so the dependent variable is in one and zero what do this one and zero what how is this distributed this is distributed this distribution is called bernoulli distribution you uh, get a he head five times tail five times this is bernoulli distribution of the 10 tosses you get three heads that is binomial distribution between head and tail it's called bernoulli distribution so it's called bernoulli variable so that's bernoulli link so uh, first thing is dependent variable is bernoulli and uh, how do i uh, use this uh, if the dependent variable is bernoulli or for that matter class categorical categorical means no anything not numerical uh, then it's called classification problem now i want to classify an applicant whether the uh, i have to classify somebody who browses my page whether he will click on the apply button or not uh, so that's the zero and one uh, so first thing is it is bernoulli distributed now we'll convert that bernoulli distribution into binomial distribution let's say for x is equal to 28 as the input four four of them did not click two of them clicked apply button if 29 as the input three of them did not click two of them clicked 30 as the input two of them did not click seven of them clicked 31 as the input two of them did not click seven of them clicked 32 as the input four of them did not click and 16 clicked 33 as the input one of them did not click and 14 of them clicked what does this mean do you see a pattern there let's say x is nothing but a credit score we have sibil scores and zero is credit card application is sanctioned not sanctioned one is sanctioned given the credit score there are some applications which are not sanctioned some applications which are sanctioned now do you see a pattern i have given you the context with this three column data actually it's only one column two column data the credit score and the application sanctioned or not that two column data got converted into this so total 60 applications are there some of them approved some of them not approved uh, for a given credit score do you see a relationship somewhere is there a linear relationship we are still talking about linear regression the higher the credit score the more are the chances of approvals the lower the credit score lower are the chances of approvals all of you see this pattern if this linear relationship is not maintained we cannot apply logistic regression non linear regression is nothing but a linear regression followed by a transformation so linearity is must actually speaking there is nothing called non linear regression there is only linear regression and some transformations so i hope all of you see this pattern since this there is only two variables and uh, there is a linear relationship between the input variable and the output variable we consider logistic regression we will also look at non linearity in this shortly okay so we do the total why we do the total we come to know the probability right so 2 divided by 6 what is the probability somebody will get an application approved if the input is 28 or the credit score is 28 it's 2 divided by 6 that is 0.333 2 divided by 5 that is 0.4 so this is the probability 
so if you notice this probability has a linear relationship as x goes up y also goes up all of you see this now let's say this is the x and this is the y what what will happen if we go and build a linear regression What will happen if the X becomes 40? If the input is 40, what will be the value of Y if you are predicting the probability? Will be more than one. I mean, just if I project It'll the line. More than one. Does that make sense? No. Similarly, if the credit score is 10, we'll end up in negative probability. That also doesn't make sense. So we need something constraining, right? So there is a Jugad media. Uh, they calculate something called odds. What is odds is P divided by Q. So this is the P, this is the probability. Q is nothing but 1 minus P. So uh, what is 1 minus P here? 1 minus 0.333 becomes 0.666. So P divided by Q is 0.5. Does that make sense? Similarly, for point, uh, 4 divided by 0.6 is, that is 4 divided by 6. It becomes 0.6667. So we calculate this odds ratio. This is the important math. Now, uh, this odds will exponentially increase. So for every unit of increase in input value, there will be more than one unit of increase in odds. Between 31 and 32, what is the increase? 0.5. Between 32 and 33, what is the increase? 10. Do you see that? Between 28 and 29, what is the increase? 0 0.16. Between 29 and 30, what is the increase? 3 point something or 2.9, whatever. So what does this mean is, though it is correlated, one increases, the other one also increases. It is not increased on the same scale, so it exponentially increases. How do we make it linear? We know it. Something is exponentially increases, we take log. That's what we did in the previous screen, right? Something is happening exponential. We take log on both the sides. This becomes linear. This is a simple math. So we take the log odds of the uh, y. Now, this log odds will be linearly associated with the input value. For every unit increase in input, there will be equal unit increase in log odds. Now, these two can be predicted. I give an input and I get log odds. So, this is the logistic regression. This transformation, if you do only log, it's called log transformation. If you do log odds transformation, uh, See, this is a log transformation. If you notice here, we made a log transformation. Here we do log odds transformation. This is called logit transformation. L-O-G-I-T. I'll show you the exact thing. Now that we use these two variables and build the linear model. Once we know the log odds, we do e to the power to get the odds. Once we know the odds, we can get the probability. Once we get the probability, we can get the uh, we can get whether the application will get approved or not. All that is possible. So we converted a Bernoulli variable, Bernoulli dependent variable into a normal dependent variable and built the linear model and work it back to get the probabilities and then decide if somebody will get the application approved or not. This is the math of the whole logistic regression. Is this clear guys? There cannot be a better explanation. This I took it from this website called wasarstats.net. This is where I got this. You also can refer to this. This is the table uh, and there's a lot more explanation here, but this is the math. So now that we got the linear regression between X and Y uh, log odds, we can convert that into logistic regression. How do we convert the log odds into logistic regression? We got this value. All that we have to do is uh, the problem with the log odds is there can be negative values. There can be more than one value and all that. So e to the power of this value will be e to the power of minus 
predicted value. What will be the e to the power of minus predicted value? Before that, what will be the e to the power of minus z? Given the minus z is given the z is higher, what will happen? e to the power of minus z will be close to zero. If uh, what will happen if z is higher and e to the power will be close to zero, you will get one divided by one, right? So that will give the maximum. If this is smaller, e to the power of minus z will be a larger number and one divided by that number will be smaller number. So depending on what the score is, you end up uh, making it. But if you notice this QI, it will never go beyond one and it will never go below zero. That's the idea. So uh, now what happens as the number increases, it will limit itself to one. As the number is smaller and smaller, it will limit itself to zero. So this Z is the number. Z is number nothing but the log odds. Uh, you put a bigger number, it will it will limit itself to one. It will never go beyond one. If you put a smaller number, it will never go below zero. So this is a transformation we do to get the probabilities. Once I know the probability, I get the threshold value. I can say above 0.5, it's uh, approved the uh, loan. Loans are getting or credit is get, credit card is getting approved. Below 0.5, credit cards should be rejected. Application should be rejected. That, that can be a threshold, can be arbitrary, depending on what the scenario is, what the context is. It can be 0.3, it can be 0.7, it can be 0.4, but this is the curve. So if you look at these dots, these dots are nothing but whether the application is approved or not. Zero means rejected, one means approved. So this is the whole math behind logistic regression. Does this all make sense? And uh, this is the code here. Code is, there are two different places code is available. I, I'll show you this page. Okay, introduction to the binomial regression model. Basically, we have converted this into a binomial distribution. Number of times we get success, right? Of the six applications, two of them successful. Of the five applications, two of them approved. Of the nine applications, seven of them approved. Of the 20 applications, 16 approved. This is nothing but a binomial case. You can see here number of visitors who downloaded the newsletter. So uh, of the 100 visitors, 20 visitors downloaded the newsletter means 0.2. So basically we converted the Bernoulli into binomial and binomial is what is converted into log odds and uh, uh, predicted. So um, that's where the binomial math is given if you want to deep dive it and log odds and all is given. and. Uh, here is, where is that? Uh, okay, here they have actually done everything, not using any of the link function, I think. Ah, here it is, the link function is logit. Model family is binomial. The same can be seen in the other page also. Yeah. Yes, if it is binomial distribution, it's called logit function. Poisson distribution, it's called log function. Normal distribution, there is no function needed. That's why they call it identity function. Is this clear? The math behind uh, logistic regression? I have given references if you want to deep dive. Otherwise, this is by and large good. In future, if you want to uh, see how do I constrain values between 0 and 1, uh, we can do this. If uh, any of you familiar with the deep learning frameworks, what is that they do softmax? Softmax, they take a score and constrain the value as between 0 and 1. They use this formula. 1 by 1 plus e to the power of that value. So the math, because we, if you know this math, you can relate it there. If you don't know this math, that also is fine. Still, logistic regression will work perfectly. So I'm going to take this to one more level up. 
if logistic regression if everybody is comfortable we will take this logistic regression is one level up and discuss one more concept before we close for the day so this is a classification problem now you all agree i am going to classify if a application will get approved or not we use regression as a technique to do classification and this works uh, if it is two variables then it's called binomial and uh, uh, logistic regression if there are more than two outcomes instead of 0 and 1 you have three outcomes four outcomes you want to categorize you want to classify between those four outcomes then it's called multinomial logistic regression and if the if the values are ordinal then you have ordinal logistic regression so that's something i'm going to write it here it's up to you to uh, read about it so what is multinomial logistic regression you can google and see there is also something called ordinal logistic regression so these two uh, scenarios appear when the number of values in the dependent variable are more than 2 and the the key assumption for logistic regression is that the linearity has to be maintained what do we mean by linearity has to be maintained or what do we mean by non linearity in classification problems is something we'll look at it okay let's move on yes so okay i didn't get the score here fine i should have got the score here okay i didn't get the score here fine this is the x axis the uh, the values of the x axis are credit scores from 0 to 1000 as the score goes up the blue color means applications are approved uh, orange color means applications are rejected fine this is the premise we right now stand on now i give you a slightly a different scenario what does this scenario mean the values in between means applications are rejected values on the extremes means applications are approved let's this is the scenario i'm throwing up it may not be a credit score it may not be a credit card application but a scenario where the in between values are positive and extreme values are negative now i want to build a classification model for this will logistic regression work people anybody wants to give it a thought we discussed this is logistic regression on the extreme values mean to extreme values mean bipolarity the higher the score approval lower the score rejection that's what extreme values mean and logistic regression kind of worked if this is the case this is non linearity how would we solve this consider as two different uh, directions that's the that's the premise we have set the premise on extreme cases positive on uh, on the cases in between it's negative now build a classification model so this is where non linearity comes into picture and uh, three algorithms work very nicely in the non linearity right so what will the tree algorithm do if the values less than 400 or values greater than 600 uh, positive if the values between 400 and 600 negative tree will if we build a tree classification tree that's what the uh, cutoffs are going to be from the data it is going to identify the cutoffs that's the job of the classification tree algorithms agreed so non linearity is addressed by tree or even probability algorithms also works naive probability algorithms also work but uh, let's say the challenge is to use the regression now the challenge is 
use logistic regression for this premise and build a model that will categorize that will classify positives versus negatives how do we go about it so um, this is a non linear problem right uh, how do we go about it first place this is a score between 0 and 1000 it's a credit card score we spoke about sibil score uh, in that case uh, we will find the mean and or let's say the mean is 400 or 500 let's take the mean and do this normalization standardization x minus mean divided by standard deviation what will happen in this particular case people please think this is a math so i don't have the math worked out i'm asking you to think about it mentally work it out so let's do the standardization x minus mu divided by sigma we take 0 to 1000 500 is the thing center so 500 will be zero above 500 it will be positive below 500 will be negative we have shifted we have done x minus mean alone or we have shifted the origin let's say 500 uh, minus and plus and then uh, we know the smaller the number minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to minus 100 plus 100 values are all positive uh, anything less than minus 100 greater than 100 is all negative right and what we do we can do the square values right we can make the square of all the values between minus 100 to plus 100 or all the values for that matter so what will happen so when we make the square all the minus will become plus and the smaller values will remain small and the larger values will become larger on either sides and we have pushed all the positives in one corner all the negatives in another corner that becomes an ex that becomes a that gives you an extreme case scenario and then you can apply the logistic regression so basically the scores are there there are 100 scores uh, we take the score and uh, subtract it with the mean and uh, square the values after we subtract it uh, we get the uh, smaller values in one extreme larger values in another extreme which is going to repeat this scenario and we can build the logistic regression so a transformation can do magic in this case so a simple uh, because if you are mathematically inclined you can think about it otherwise you can simply apply tree and tree will do a decent job in um, categorizing positives with negatives and uh, so long as we have trained data test data and both um, have similar accuracies Uh, and similar errors we are good with it does that make sense we basically converted this data into this data the x axis values have removed it sorry the x axis values are nothing but 0 to 1000 on both the scales and uh, i am not, not discussing the standard math like confusion matrix and all they are all very standard very available but uh, the objective is how do i encourage you to think mathematically and apply mathematics to problem solving so you want me to explain this one more time we'll see if people have questions i'll explain it and uh, this is all i had for the day so if there are questions we'll discuss people can unmute and uh, we can discuss if you want so the transformation example it was really good okay so you understood 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, then that means I've done somewhat a better job. Thanks. So, so one one question like uh, it's like not related to the topic. Can I ask that? Like sure, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, I could not uh, get access to this. Like I am also joining uh, this meeting from browser, so I could not get the my hands to this. Slide. So how do I get it? Because I have still joined from browser only. Okay, it's uh, your content, uh, the slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slides and sheet are available in the uh, Google Drive. Uh, you can. Uh, uh, the Google Drive will be provided along with the YouTube video, which will be present in our channel, Devopedia channel, shortly. Okay, okay. And uh, like I am not working in uh, this domain, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm interested in this. So, how does uh, like the maths you are telling me, like mm -hmm. how do I uh, like uh, now start with this domain? Like, uh, start solving the problem. Take okay. a problem and solve it and uh, mathematically try to reason it. Why something works, how some things work. What will happen if I tweak something? OK, OK. I would say I would even say that build the whole model in Excel. Don't use Python libraries. Then okay. it will be if you're mathematically inclined to do so. I don't compel you. You can use Python. That's going to give you excellent results. You will save a lot of time. All that is great. But if you're mathematically inclined to do so, take a problem, solve the whole problem with Excel. OK, OK. Sir. By putting the formula down, working out the distributions, everything. Right from plotting the histogram. I, 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 I learned a lot from Excel, doing things in Excel. OK. Thank you, sir. Uh, one uh, basic question I have. Uh, sure. uh, the examples what you shown with a picture of uh, something is linear versus nonlinear. Mm -hmm. So there we could see, let's say visibly, uh, something is, I mean, the scatter if we see, mm -hmm. something is like, you know, evenly crowded along the average line linearly and then other place it is not evenly crowded so that visibly says it is not linear mm -hmm. but uh, if we have a large data set uh, how do we make out the linearity calculate whether it standard is deviation that's all calculate standard deviation where x is equal to filter for x is equal to 1.5 get all the values calculate standard deviation standard deviation here will be much smaller compared to standard deviation here Standard deviation is a measure, right? Uh, that's it's a measure. Okay. Okay. In this case, standard deviation will be constant. May not be exactly equal, but it will be in the same range. In this case, uh, it will be way out of. No, no. I'm I'm trying to understand. For example, are there some test functions which can uh, you know say whether it is linear or not linear? Yes. Uh, there are tests. Uh, statistical tests which will tell whether data is normally distributed or not. That's something you can look at it. Uh, if normally distributed or not. Uh, linearity is between two variables. If the very if the uh, relationship is linear or not, that also there's a test. You can take a look at it. But uh, whether um, whether it has constant variance or uh, increasing variance and all, there is no test. You have to calculate the variance and then uh, inspect if the variance is varying or is it same. Okay. 